You can try to restart things if you want to. You, you're not going to have any wise people there, I can tell you that. Wise folk are not going to be there. And they still love Jesus, but they love themselves as well. I would encourage you, you go to the church by yourself. Get in your office, close the door. Don't have no secretary down there, nobody. Don't don't, don't let Sister Sylvia come out. You at the church? Let me come out and talk to you. No, 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 no. You can't do that, Sister Sylvia. Uh-uh. For several reasons. Well, I'm not scared. Yeah, I know. That's why we're in the mess we're in today, because of you. So, uh-uh. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't have you down here. Uh, I want one car in the parking lot. Give me some room on that. I want one car in the parking lot, mine, that's it, my wife. She can come down here. If we die, we die together. So, uh, go to your church office, Pat, you, if you have to get out of the house, some of y'all have to get out of the house, you can't stay in, some of you pastors can't stay in the house with your wife all day long, you know it, she'll run you slap crazy, because you're not the head of the household, she is, and you're frustrated, she's really the pastor of the church, through pillow talk, she makes you do all kinds of crazy things. So you be the man, you be the man, and you go down to your church office, close that door, and you get along with God. Stay there for about 10 hours, and you pray, and you just read your Bible. Read your Bible. And I know you have that program. I have it, too. They gave it to me free. What's the name of that program that we use? preaching, huh? Say it again. Logos, logos, yeah. Wonderful program. You could, but see, you get, you can get caught up in that and be there all day long. Read your Bible. Okay, you can turn around in the back. Read your Bible, man. Man, uh, I'm talking male pastors. Go to your office. And read your Bible. Don't read anybody's blog. You can read your Bible on the computer. That's fine. Don't go look at, looking at what so-and-so is saying. He doesn't know. He helped put us in the mess with his new ideas. He has no clue. He doesn't even know God in, in, a, in, 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 a, in a real sense. Just knows how to persuade people uh, to believe stuff that's anti-Bible. You know how you were with God a long time ago after you got saved. Get back to that. Send out some digital tracks. Pray for your people. Figure out how you can sell a building uh, for a million dollars and give the money to the poor people who need it. Instead of hearing about them and seeing them in a 10,000 point line. Are you kidding me? Figure out how you can sell your million dollar, $1.235 million house and give the money to the members of the church who need food, who need diapers, what? Who need, uh, they need for you to pay their mortgage and their rent, especially you prosperity gospel preachers. And uh, sell your Bentley, and you can feed a thousand people with that alone. Sell it, downsize, preacher. If there ever was a time to downsize, downsize now. And love your people. And in love your community. The, the people need food. And let me tell you something. In Texas, Texas don't, people in Texas don't ask for, they don't ask for anything. They don't want welfare. They don't want a box. But they are in 10,000 car lines in Texas. In the wonderful 
beautiful, affluent place that I live. I saw people in a, in a line at a uh, vegetable thing in where I live. I said, what? That's how bad it is. And we need for you to do something, Pastor. We, we can't wait. We, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't deal with, we can't wait on the GUV. Even Jack Graham called him Uncle Sam. <laughs> I never heard Jack Graham say, he called the government Uncle Sam. He, he, he said, it's okay. Uncle Sam is all right, you know, something to that effect. But we need God. <laughs> he, he's right. I have heard, I, I never heard Jack Graham call the government Uncle Sam. But he did yesterday. Bless his heart. He's seeing the light. You can't depend. Listen, the government is already broke. The government is in debt. They are borrowing the money to give to you. So your people, your 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 your, your people, need some help from the church. Get a line going. Get a line going right in front of your church, and have your people out there working. And giving them a box of food and a check. And 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 I appreciate you sending food to the workers at the hospital. God bless your heart. I appreciate you clapping. Which to me means nothing. Those people at the hospital need a check. What are you talking about? <laughs> they need... <clears throat> they need their mortgage paid. Seriously, people. I'm not talking for the month. Pay the house off. Put their children through college. Pay for that. Double their salary. All of the frontline workers, not only at the hospital, all the frontline workers at the grocery store, all of the frontline workers, uh, Taking care of America. Somebody said last night, Spike Lee said last night, it's mostly black and brown. We holding the whole thing down. Huh? What? Don't get me. This will be a prayer meeting. Don't get me started. That's what needs to be. That's what needs to happen. All this clapping. Hey. <laughs> Hitting pots together. We're so happy for, we're so proud of y'all. We thank y'all for almost nine for, no man, double their salary for the whole year. Bam! Pay their house off. Bam a lamb. Put their children through college. Give them some real help. <clears throat> Give them the protection stuff they need and stop all this clapping. And send the McDonald's down there. Ah, uh, no. See, I, I didn't mean to say all this. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just tired. A whole bunch of foolishness. And I, I can't imagine people being appreciative of the clapping. I can't. I, I, I would, I would be mad about the clapping. No, man, give me my, give me what I need. Put me in a hotel, a nice suite that you're not using anyway. <clears throat> so I won't drag this beast to my house, to my children. I love my children just like you do. Anyway, God bless you. Don't you get mad. Be glad somebody's telling you the truth. Be glad nobody is compromising and somebody's not compromising with you. And telling you the truth. Like we used to do. And see, that's what God wants you to go back to. Stop thinking you're going to go, go back to what you had. That's that's gone, man. Okay? That's gone. And it's going to be gone for a while. The whole shebang should change. I just pray. So, my beloved, Dr. Vance Havner, my man.
said revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. Let me repeat that. That's happening. You still doing what you normally do over there? Okay, great. Go ahead and wrap that up. We need for you to come in, come online over here. We need for you to come online over here. Vance Havner said, Revival is falling in love with Jesus. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. All over again. Vance Havner said, Revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. I've told you that the New Testament revival is getting back to Jesus. Getting back to your first love, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's New Testament revival. It's basically the same thing that Vance Havner was saying. He's another prophet, modern day prophet of old, who was a prophet to pastor. A, a prophet to pastors uh, and to the church. If you have never read Vance Havner, preacher, after you finish reading your Bible, go get you a book, order your book, get your book online, an e-book <coughs> from, uh, written by Vance Havner. And if you don't come out your office a new man, I, I, I'll I'll eat this microphone. Same thing for Leonard Ravenwood. And then he said, if you can't pray as you want to pray, as you can, let me, let me, let me make sure. Let's say, gotta, he, you did him with Vance Havner, you got to pay attention too, though. If you can't pray as you want to pray, Pray as you can. Okay, I got it. I got it. Are you getting that? Let me repeat that again with you. If you can't pray as you want to, pray as you can. That means, basically, if you don't feel like praying in the morning, you pray anyhow. And you will find that with most of us who still have the flesh, 90 point, 91, 92, 93% of the time, you're not going to feel like praying. We got some fakers who act like they always wound up for God. And you got to watch people like that in the church. You need to stay away from people. They're all fired up all the time. They feel like serving God and praying to God all the time. That's, that's not the yeah, that's not that's not realistic. Serving God is a fight. It's a battle. Sometimes it's a struggle, and uh, only God can help you to do it, to do it right. But Vance Havner goes on to say, God knows what you mean. The 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 thermometer of a church is its prayer meeting. That's the thermometer of a church. And that's one of the reasons why we're in the plague we're in. Because the church stopped praying a long time ago. And they started strategizing and thinking of their ideas and what they want to do. And uh, mine is God and his power. That's why preachers are powerless, pastors are powerless, the church is powerless. And it's a big old Disney world in most many churches today. And that's why God has shut down the churches. And that's why God is permanently removing angels, that is messengers, pastors. Hundreds of pastors and priests have died.
and, this, and, and my preaching on this or saying something about it does not mean that I won't die in the coronavirus plague. But see, my attitude is this. I have fought a good fight, and I have kept the faith. I really truly believe that God has used me for what he wanted to use me for. And my attitude and spirit is, as I've told God many times, and I've tried to lead you to tell God the same thing, that I deserve to die, to suffer and to die in the coronavirus plague just like anybody else. God knows it, and I know it. And on top of that, I deserve hell, and so do you. So, so Lord, if it be your will, I would, I would prefer not to go through the hell and the pain of the coronavirus disease beast monster. Even Dr. T.D. Jake said, I don't want, I want no parts of that. No, man. Uh-uh. I want no parts of that right there. You know why he, does, he doesn't want it? Because he's seen it up close and personal. See, some of you folks have not seen it up close and personal. He has church members and preacher friends in the hospital right now on a ventilator. <clears throat> Did you hear what I said? All times of the day and night, he's got to take the phone calls from preacher friends that he's ministered to, hundreds of folks and thousands of folks. The wife is calling. She's a widow now calling and screaming in his ear at all times of the night. And I don't know if I don't know if TD Jake was trying to send a message to somebody or something, but he frankly said, "I can do without that for the rest of my life." That that screaming in my ear and that crying and that holler, he said, uh, "Surely I, I can. I guarantee you, I can do. I can do without that for the rest of my life." Now he he didn't mean it the way uh, that uh, I'm suggesting. He just don't want to go through that pain anymore. And the pastors are far more sensitive than people like myself. And he tried his best when he gave that wonderful speech on how that just because people open up stuff does not mean you need to go to their stuff. Be wise. Don't be foolish. He actually said that. And I was so glad to hear him say that. But he tried his best. He almost broke down and cried twice. And 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 because he held, he was he was fighting it. Uh, I shed a tear. I, I'm I'm not a crying man. I was I was not crying for the people because I don't know the people that he's talking about. But because he was fighting them tears, man, that that that. Getting to, the, getting to me. And he's not the only pastor who has church members like that. And in that situation. But I thank God for the pastors who are standing up, telling people the truth, and helping the people every day, and preaching more now than ever before reaching more people than they've ever reached before in their lives, in the plague, while people are dying. For we are standing, as the Bible says, between the living and the dead. Dr. James W. Alexander said the simple fact that parents and offspring meet together every morning and evening for the word of God and prayer. And let me tell you, some of you folks, based upon what Vance Havner told you, I don't care how what the atmosphere is in your house, start praying and see when God changes it. You might be stuck on a project, pray every hour. Ask God to help you with it and see when God push it on through for you. 
and help you push, push you through. In your family, you want to change the atmosphere in your family, pray. But see, that's a, that's a, you don't want to do that. That's your problem. I mean, just a, from a dry spot, just start praying. Okay? Just get to going in prayer. You don't have to be fanciful and fancy and try to sound all holy and shaking and loud. And that's not fervent praying. You can pray in a very calm fashion and be praying your heart out. If God can speak to you in a still, small voice, you can speak to God in a still, small voice. Your gyrating does not mean anything. If you want to gyrate, gyrate. But I'm just saying. I mean, you don't. You don't. You don't have to do that to, to act like you're praying. I've been in prayer meeting where people want to grab your hand. You know, they form a circle, and I'm all for that. But then there's a joker always in that crowd. Grab your hand, squeeze the blood out of your hand, and shaking your hand up and down, and up and down, and up and down, and gyrating, and so forth. And I'll be one to me say, leave my hand alone. Let go of my hand. You know, uh, yeah, that's not necessary, man. You, you squeeze it, you, you cutting off my circulation, all that. And your prayer is probably not even, it's always somebody, and they're the most wicked person in the church. They're evil as hell who want to always show out. Try to sound like this. So, I know y'all don't like it, but it's true. Always want to show out and try to sound all spiritual. And, 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 and act all spiritual. And there's nothing there at all. I hate that. Hypocrisy. With religious folk. <clears throat> But back to this wonderful quote regarding prayer in the family. The simple fact that parents and offspring meet together every morning for the word of God in prayer is a great fact in household annals. It is the inscribing of God's name over the lintel. It is the setting up of God's home. The dwelling is marked as a house of prayer. My God, my God. Help us to get back to that. Is your house a house of prayer? Come on now, tell the truth. Or is it a house of hell raising? A house of anger? A house of resentment? of bitterness, a house of foolishness, a house where there's no productivity. Your family ought to be productive. Not just your church, not just your business, not just your enterprises, but your family. You ought to, as a family, y'all ought to be producing stuff. Making stuff. Getting stuff done. Checklists. Accomplishing something. And, and a part of that is reaching people for Christ. Your family ought to be a soul-winning unit of your local church. You talk about a cell group, that's your family right there, man. And you, sir, husband and father, you ought to be leading. You're the pastor of that, that church. If your last name is Holmes, the Holmes House of Prayer, you're the pastor there. Jesus is right over you. Not the pastor, Jesus is going to come down to your family. Not the pastor. The pastor is not over your family, over your wife and children. No, uh, no. And you need to stop going to the pastor and, and the wife for advice and counsel. You don't need to do that. That's not even in the Bible. Because oftentimes they're not even right. They don't. Their family is not together. The news is out this morning. That uh, 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 what's the boy name? Kanye and Kim, which I predicted was going to happen. They're they're sleeping at uh, 
both ends of the house. She's, she's on one end, he's on another. And that's what a lot of pastors and wives do. They, they don't meet together until Sunday morning so they can get paid. I know you don't like me to say it, but it's true. The family's not worth a flip. The marriage is not worth a flip. It's an arrangement, a business arrangement. And they put on an act. Not all, some. You can tell those who really got something going on. You know Tony and, and Lois had something going on. You know T.D. Jakes and his wife got something going on. It's not perfect, but, but it is, it's a real situation. And these prophetesses, bless your heart, these prophetesses, these, these, now they're calling themselves evangelists, these women who want to preach to men. Why don't we ever see their husband? Where, where's the husband? They just go here, go there, and so forth and so on. And let me just tell you some, some of you wives who want to be preachers over men and everybody else. If you're not taking care of your husband, and you're not respecting and respecting and honoring your husband, you never take your husband with you. You got other men that travel with you. You don't keep your house clean. You don't make sure your husband is fed, your children are fed. How can you if you're always gone? You're trying to be like uh, some uh, some of these other male evangelists and pastors. Your first calling, honey, is your husband and your children. And so if you're not taking care of business at home, you're disqualified. I thought I'd just tell you that. You need to sit down somewhere and, and, and uh, your husband needs to be with you when you go somewhere, and your children. That's one of the reasons why we're in the plague. Now you can't go anywhere. Because you're not doing what you're supposed to do at home first. And, 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 and many of us have not learned the concept and don't understand the concept from Proverbs 31, male and female. In time to come, you get to do certain things like that. But you got to do your main job at home. If you fail at home, you fail everywhere. Do you hear me? And if you and you if you women are not going to preach to women about being godly, biblical, obedient, faithful submissive wives, you have no message. And if you're not doing it, you can't tell them to do it. And one of the biggest problems in the church today, we don't have any older women dressing modestly, acting godly, having loved and cared for their husband and raised their children, telling the younger women how to do it. Because you got to take care of the home. You don't take care of the home. Everything you got going is a fraud. <clears throat> it's a sham. And you just out there hustling meetings like evangelists used to do back in the day. Hustling me. I'm going to be in town. Yeah. If, uh, let me come by. You know, I'll preach for you. I'll give you a love offering. It's basically what you're asking for a love offering. Some money. Honorarium. You're just hustling meetings, and you can't hustle right now. You got to stay home. And some of you are miserable. Some of you, you prophetesses, and you evangelists, kids, and you're right where God wants you to be. Home, taking care of your husband, hopefully, and your children. And you can't hate your husband and love your children. I know many of you do, but you're not supposed to do that. For to love your husband and respect your husband in front of your children and love and care for your children too. And you're disqualified from being a prophetess. Bless your little heart. Go ahead and tell, go, I know you're mad at me right now. Go ahead and tell everybody else. Go ahead and invite the people that, that Daniel White the third is going off again. I can't stand him, but I want you to hear what he's saying. Some of you prophetesses and you evangelists family is shot to hell, 
and you're not going to know your children because you're too busy out trying to save the world when you should have been home trying to save your little children. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to listen to me very carefully and mark my words because I told my wife the same thing when the children were being born. I said, your job, sweetheart, your job is to make memories of these children. And, and if you don't do it, you're going to regret it. She did not do it, and she's regretting it to this day. And when they start leaving, buddy, that's going to be a blow upside your head that you can't handle it because you know you didn't give them 100%. A nurse on the news, I believe, last night, yesterday sometime, She's a nurse. She's doing a wonderful job. She's trying to save lives in this plague pandemic. But she says her little girl is always in her mind, always in her heart. And she broke down crying. She said, I am failing her while I'm out here risking my life and risking her life trying to help somebody else. Of, of my job. I think she said that that may not sound uh, feminist, but that's the reality. She said, as a mother, I feel like I, I have failed as a mother to that child. And some of you prophetesses, some of you, some of you uh, evangelists, now you're calling yourself an evangelist, and some of you pastors, whole pastors, supposedly with your husband, which is not in the Bible. None of that's in the Bible, except for prophecy. But I want you to know your first job is to take care of your husband and your children, and you ought to respect your husband enough to make sure that y'all you go over meetings together and y'all stay together, and you raise your children together, and you don't dump your children on your husband while you go save the world. Or some babysitter, God forbid, talking about care.com, my foot. You know, they got a bunch of perverts doing babysitting. You don't know that devil. Don't leave your child with the devil. I've never left my children with a babysitter. Never. Uh uh. Someone tried to tell me one time you ought to leave your children with a babysitter and let your wife get free for a few days. God didn't ever tell us to do that. Why would God give us the children for us to leave the children with somebody else? That's not even in the Bible. You, you don't know how perverted and wicked some people are. I'm talking about church folk, too. And I told my second daughter, some folks uh, who were inviting her to do some babysitting, I said, don't do that. You're risking your life fooling around with people who won't keep their own children. Sometimes they're single mothers, got men running in and out of the house, three, two and three sets of children. You don't need to do that. Don't babysit for people. Just, just, just go ahead on and uh, uh, downsize. Don't try to live high on the hog. Downsize. You're risking your life. You're risking uh, something bad happening to that child, and they're going to sue you. And you don't have any insurance or nothing. I told my own daughter that. Don't be babysitting nobody's children. Especially children, they're they, they, they not even raised them right themselves. They don't even, the children don't even respect the parents. They're not going to respect you. For some, a few little dollars. Anyway. Religion is thus made a substantive and prominent part of the domestic plan. Let's pray for the family. Holy Father God in heaven, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would heal every Christian marriage and family through prayer, through confession of sin, through repentance, and through people who are truly born again and saved, <clears throat> doing what your Holy Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and in Ephesians chapter 6. 
and through the family altar or family uh, devotional time. One of the reasons why, Lord, you led me to do this special service, which my wife did not want me to do, and uh, my children did not want me to do. And I balked at it and didn't obey you for about two weeks when you were telling me to do it. Uh, but I'm so glad that uh, you convinced me in no uncertain way to do it because you know and I know most people, even in this plague, are not praying as they should. And they will not make it through this plague. They will not survive it successfully if they don't pray. Marriages are already breaking up. Families are already breaking up. Some families have hellacious things going on in the family already and had, had it going on before, but it's worse now. It's intensified. People are not praying to you so that they, even your people are not praying to you so that they can make the right decisions because many people need to make a decision right now and they don't even realize it. They need to sell their house. They need to get out of the apartment and they need to move out into the countryside in something that they own. They need to downsize with the quickness and they, they're not following your, they're not praying to you so that they can get that from you. They're not praying for their family. They're not praying together as a family. And so you're leading me to help encourage them to do that. And if they don't want to do it, to do it with us. And so, Holy Father God, I thank you, and you led me to do it for so many reasons. And, uh, and I thank you for that. It is extra stress and pressure to our ministry here, but it's worth it. And there's a hunger for this. And we give you the glory, praise, and honor for your leadership. And you know how to replenish us uh, if we sacrifice for you and your kingdom. And Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the healing of every Christian marriage and family that way. And we pray for the salvation of all families that don't know you. And Holy Father God, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins as Christians <clears throat> of not obeying your great commission or your great commandment and not witnessing to the families that are lost. And we pray that you'll raise up laborers into the harvest field ready to be saved so that they can even know that there is in Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6 and, uh, where you speak to the wife, you speak to the husband, and you speak to the children. And if we all do what we're supposed to do in those two passages of Scripture, we'll have instantaneous peace and joy and a little piece of heaven in our family. It will never be perfect because we're not perfect and we're dealing with people who have a sinful nature and we are dealing with a devil who will attack the weakest ones to cause a problem every now and then. And that's why you tell us in that same passage that we ought to pray without ceasing, that we ought to pray always to be more precise. Help us to do it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for sake. Amen. Please recite with me or read with me the Nicene Creed. I hope that this is the one that I uh, added to and uh, rewrote, uh, so to speak. Just one section I added to it, which uh, is a part of the gospel, which they didn't put in it. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation. And he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And here is where I add it. Uh, he was seen by Mary Magdalene and the other women and the disciples and over 500 other brethren. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. <clears throat> he spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen and amen. Holy Father God, we thank you for the faith that once delivered unto the saints. It is so much fun to me and uh, so joyful uh, a thing to uh, read and recite the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed because we take a journey back into Christian history and we remember it, uh, we remember the faith once delivered to the saints in a concise manner that covers the whole Bible and we give you the glory the praise and the honor uh, help, and help us to act like we believe it it ought to change our lives because it is based upon your holy word in Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Today we're going to talk to the husbands we, from the word of God. And we talked to the wives on yesterday. Uh, first three or four days I read the entire uh, passage dealing with the family verses. What I call the family verses. I believe with all of my heart that if... Any family, particular Christian family, was simply everybody in the family, individually, not contingent upon what somebody else does in the family. If everybody did their part in the family, based upon what God says here, you would have peace and love and joy in your household. And you can get things done. You can educate your children. You can start a business, uh, you can get projects done, uh, you can have worship together, but you need to read all of these verses from Ephesians 5.22 on down, and then from Ephesians 6.1 on down, because God deals with the wife, the husband, the parents, and the children, and he also tells you how to deal with the devil who will attack your family. If you try to do anything for God, if you and your family, when you go to the grocery store or to McDonald's, you pass out gospel tracts, the devil is going to fight you. If you pray in the morning, the devil is going to fight you. Any little thing you do like that right there, the devil is going to fight you tooth and nail, and he's going to be on you like black on, uh, on me and white on rice. So let's talk to the husbands this morning. And, and see, it's what's so sad is when uh, 
I talk to the husband. The wife says, yeah, that's right. Talk to that mean old dog. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, they don't mind that. But they can't stand it when I talk to them from the Word of God. But that's all right. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 on down. We're going to do 33 tomorrow. 33 deals with the husband and the wife. I believe that's the last verse in the chapter. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. This is not a suggestion. This is a commandment, just like it is a commandment to wives to submit to their husbands and obey their husbands and reverence their husbands. That's a commandment. That's not a suggestion. Paul was not into giving suggestions, nor was God. Even as Christ also loved the church. And this does not mean the false notion in, in our evangelical circles that uh, the husband would give the wife everything regardless of how she acts. Just let her have her way. No, that's not what Jesus does not do us that way. And gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Gentlemen, pastors included, if you are compromising God's word to please your wife, you are out of line, sir. You're not helping her. She knows you're not helping her. And eventually, she's going to get sick and tired of you after she beats you down to a pulp and to a little sycophantic little boy listening to everything she tells you to do. She's going to, and she's going to be looking for a real man real quick if you let her have her way like that. That's not what she wants deep down. Don't, don't believe that lie, sir. Deep down, she wants a man who is going to love her and love her so much that he's going to tell her the truth. And sometimes look at her and say, don't steal my cashews no more. You know I'll be looking for them cashews at night when I'm watching television. Don't be stealing my cashews. Ask me for my cashews, man. Uh, we, 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 uh, we're supposed to share everything together and equal. No we, no, no, we don't either. If you want some cashews, I'll buy you a can, and I'll have my can. So when I'm sitting down ready to look at Fraser. I can eat my cashews. Now, she ain't going to run away because you won't let her have a way and steal from you and then lie about it. What happened to my cashews? You know I love my cashews at night around 8 o'clock. What happened to them? And then she lie. And then, then she lie on the children. I guess one of the children. No, you're a liar. See? And, 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 and that's not hatred for telling her the truth, that she can't steal from you and then lie about it. Or take something that you she knows you expect to be there at a certain time and it's gone. And you don't feel like going back out to get it anymore when all she had to do was ask for them herself. There's nothing wrong with telling your wife the truth, sir, and tell her, don't do that again. Tell her, okay, now God has blessed you with children, take care of your children. No, you can't go with the girl your girlfriends tonight shopping or whatever y'all doing. We got four children in there. And I want you here to take care of them. They need their mother. And you tell your girlfriend what I said. And no, you're not going to the church either. You tell the pastor I said you can't go to the church. In fact, for the next eight weeks, I want you to stay home. You can't go to the church every day. You 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 take care of me and your children. And if she gets mad about it, so be it. She's huffy and puffy, so be it. Don't, 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 don't uh, <clears throat> back down on it. <clears throat> and she'll li listen to me, sir. Deep down in her heart, maybe not on the surface, but deep down in her heart, she'll love you more and respect you more if you tell her the truth. Okay? This, this does not mean you need to become a little pansy. I don't know where our sweet little evangelicals got that from. That is not biblical. God, from the top down to the bottom, deals in truth. The truth will set you free, set your marriage free. 
and you're in charge. So what you say needs to go. Now, if you're a liar yourself, then Jesus is going to deal with you. Don't, don't you. And you wives don't have to worry about trying to uh, box up your husband and, and tame them and control them. God would, God would do a wonderful job if you let it alone, let it go. Let God deal with them. Let God deal with your husband because he knows how to deal with them, Jack. Oh, yes, you don't have to worry about a thing. You just do your job. The Bible talks about how that even if you have a lost husband, you ought to submit to him and respect him and have a meek and quiet spirit. Now, I'm sharing this with you because you, 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 especially now, every day, because you are stuck in the house with your mate. And that's not an easy thing for Americans. And if you don't do it God's way, it's going to be a big old mess. Y'all going to, if you ever get out, you're going to be mad as hell when you get out. While you're in, you won't be having sex like you ought to be. You're going to be frustrated and hard up uh, when you get out the house, trying to try to find Bo Peep and trying to find Sylvia. When that's not the solution. you got to learn how to love each other and get along with each other, and you got to do it God's way, not your way. See? Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And I believe that this is across the board. You got some wicked, evil, crossed up, sick men who don't have natural affection. But I believe that most men, particularly who are saved, they love their wives and they want the best for their wives and they want their wives to look the best and be the best. This is why it it takes a long time for a man to tell the truth about the evil ways of his wife. Most men will never do it. There's always the wife who goes out there running or talking about the husband and how bad the marriage is to the pastor and to the pastor's wife and other people. In most cases. Most men don't want that. You know why men don't want that? You know why most men don't, will never do that? Because of their pride. Most men have pride. And they want their wives uh, to be somebody they, they can be proud of. And so men, you have men, women who lie, but men lie too. About how wonderful their wives are when he knows and God knows she's a witch and stubborn and rebellious, manipulative, always trying to take control over the man. But he's really getting real with you, and it's going to be a while when he tells you that, you know, where my wife is just not lining up with the Scriptures. It's going to be a while for a man to do that. But sometimes a man needs to tell the truth about his family and that they are not all that before it blows up in the first place. Because eventually, she's going to tell the truth. Even if they break up and divorce, she's going to tell the truth. You know what? It it really wasn't him. It was me. But see, it's too late at that point. And the devil has already destroyed your family. Because the devil is behind the mess in the first place. Verse 29, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. There's nothing like the love of a man for a woman. There's nothing like it. Uh, Even if there's some cacophony and some, uh, uh, some conflict, there's nothing more beautiful than the love of a husband for 
his wife and a wife for her husband. And this is why I'm hoping that the powers that be will always, if they're going to continue to make movies, make it about a man and a woman. Not one stinking man with another stinking man. God forbid. That's an ugly situation. And I don't care if you like it or lump it or choke on it. I can care less. That's an ugly, that's an ugly plot. I hate him. I'm going to report him to Facebook. I'm going to report him to YouTube. Go ahead. I've already been reported, but they, they know that I'm preaching the word. They, 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 they're not going to uh, try to take on something like that. But I hope by the grace of God. If you read a book, if you read a movie, or you, you see a movie, there's nothing more beautiful than a man and a woman getting together. Nothing. And, and, and there's nothing like true love for a woman, a man has. And, and we thank God for Dr. Tony Evans. Uh, Dr. Tony Evans loved Lois. You can see it in his eyes. We thank God for those couples that have what, what Chuck Swindoll called the original match or something to that effect. They, 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 got, they got that love for each other, and they like being with each other, not only for sex purposes, but they like being with, with each other, experiencing things together, and so forth and so on. That's how it ought to be. But you can't compromise the Bible to have it because you don't have anything. Okay? You don't have anything, sir, and she doesn't have anything. Every woman listening to me would rather have a husband who tells her the truth about herself and, and tell her what he expects of her as her uh, authority, authority figure over her. It's no equal husband-wife team thing. She is under him. He is over her. Stop lying, people. And she wants it like that. Deep down. Deep down in her heart, and I say to any woman who does not want that, don't get married and try to change what God put together. Leave it alone. You want to be your own boss, and you want to run things, and uh, you want a man to be a little puppy? I saw something recently. Two ladies talking about, you know, how we 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 women love puppies in, in, in connection to how how to get a man. You know how we women love puppies. You know how cute they are, and so forth and so on. And uh, I said, I, I could, I, I listened to that for a little. I said, I, I can't even get my head around what these women are talking about. Are they comparing men to little puppies? You, you want a pet, or do you want a man? That, that's the question that came to my mind. If you want a pet, you better get a pet. But your man is not your pet. And eventually he's going to break out like the Incredible Hulk and let you know that he <laughs> you're not going to treat me like a little boy, like your pet girl. Are you crazy? Verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh. I know what you want me to tell. You. I know what you want me to say. You want me to tell the lies that many pastors have told. Now, men, here's how you love your wife now. Buy her some flowers on Thursday. Go ahead and spend about $150, $200, get a babysitter for Friday. Make no difference. Your house is nasty. Dishes in the sink. And uh, she hasn't had sex with you all week, even though you, you try to make a move. And uh, her children running around with snotty nose and diapers hanging down and everything else. Uh, you take her out on a date on Friday. Spend $200 for the babysitter, $150. And uh, you go spend another hundred fifty dollars for the meal, a romantic meal, hoping to get some loving. That's not going to work, sir. You need to stop believing those lies. You need to do it God's way. And when every now and then you got it, you got it going on in the marriage and the family. Doesn't, unconditional love does not mean you got to do a whole lot for somebody all the time. Especially in a marriage and family, you hardly have enough money to survive. 
she knows that you, you, you still love her, even though you can't take your wife on a date night every uh, week like uh, Pastor and his wife. They have unlimited funds. You don't. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. And we need, we, we need more millennials leaving their father and their mother. It's a natural thing. One of the reasons why your adult children are so bitter or resentful, uh, got nasty attitudes and so forth, is because they ought to be gone. They ought to be gone and married and raising their own family. Hooking up with a, if it's a daughter with a man, a good man, there are not many to find out there. If it's a son with a good woman, that's just natural. This is natural. Leave your father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. And I'm going to stop right there. And we'll deal with verse 33 tomorrow. Our devotional passage for today, after we pray, is Psalm 50, verses 7 through 15. Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, heal every Christian marriage and family based upon your holy word. And Lord, help people to get real with you. Help men to be the husbands and the fathers you want them to be. If there is something wrong in their family life, help them to correct it. Help them to rebuke those who are doing evil. Help them to chastise those who are doing wrong so that there can be real, genuine peace in the home and productivity and good done to the subjects, those who are supposed to be in subjection those who are supposed to submit. Lord, uh, help the husbands and the fathers to do good for them, to rebuke them, to chastise them when it is needed, so that later on in life they will appreciate it because uh, they have learned obedience through the things they suffered and that they will not have to go through things that other people go through because they didn't have a father, didn't have a husband to tell them the truth and to rebuke them when necessary so that they can have real peace in the home and a real relationship with uh, one another in the family. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for sake. Amen. Verse 7, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings, who have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink blood of goats, offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Did you notice that? God wants you to give him thanksgiving. 
He wants you to thank him. He wants you to be grateful to him for what you have and uh, to understand you ought to be thankful for allowing things uh, to be as good as they are because they could be worse. For example, those of you who are listening to me right now, you could be dead. You could, you might be in a bad family situation, but you could be in a situation where you don't have a family at all. And family is a good thing if you do your part in the family. And when it's time for you to leave, that's a good thing too, to start your own family. One preacher said during a Thanksgiving service one time, thank God you got somebody in the family to fuss with. Because see, when they're dead, you, you can't even fuss with them. Either. And here's what you're going to say. Well, I tell you, we, you know, we had our issues, but I tell you what, I sure miss him. I sure miss her. I tell you, and then tears start flowing. Dr. Tony Evans said, all, all you people, after Lois Evans died, he said, all you people was doing all this silent treatment, not talking, not having sex together. He may not have mentioned that sex part. All that evil mess people do. I saw it happen in my family growing up. I said, I'm not going to have no marriage like that. My dad, my dad, I heard him one night, he thought I was asleep. My, my room was dark, and their bedroom was across from mine. And My dad was a bishop and all that. They were church people. But my dad, I heard my dad use a word that I can't use in church, but he said, uh, he said, uh, you can't keep the pee in the, in the pocket. <laughs> I was I was a teenager. I was wide awake. He was telling my wife, my mother rather. Uh, he was telling my, his wife, my mother, you can't keep the pee in the pocket. I said what? It's not it's not to be kept in the pocket. I said, what? and he thought I was asleep, but I heard that. I heard some other things too. What was he talking about? He was talking about that they were not having sex because she's mad at him for nothing. Or for something. That's not, that, you can't use stuff. You can't use what God has given you like that for your soul. See, they didn't even know what the Bible said that you're not supposed to do that. But she was, she was putting him on hold because they were not getting along. And this stuff, this silent treatment, I, oh, my soul. I saw this silent treatment mess go on in our family for weeks. Go get up in the morning, don't say anything. All day long, don't say anything. No phone call. Go to work, don't say anything. Come back home, they don't say look at each other, don't say anything. That's that's, that's foolishness, man. You say, Well, has your wife ever tried to do the silent treatment on you? Yes. Did she ever try to pull a stunt like that that, like, that your mother put? Yes, but I I'm I'm not gonna let her do that, see. I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna start the conversation. I'm going to initiate whatever I want to do. I don't care about her being mad. And normally, once you go ahead on and communicate and you do what you're supposed to do as a married couple, after after that, you, you, you everything's all right anyway. Verse 15, And call upon me in the day of trouble, God said, I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. So you better love the one you're with. Thank God for the one you're with. Because one day, and in this day and time, we got, listen to me, people. Right at 3,000 people, they're not going to tell you the truth. Right at 3,000 people died yesterday from the coronavirus. 3,000 people from this plague. And if you're sitting around here thinking the plague's not going to get you, it can and will. So you better enjoy your mate while you can and cut this foolishness out, this silent treatment, pocket situation. 
uh, uh, all that foolishness. That's childishness. That's what you did back in when you was a child and teenager, man. Some of your husbands got to put your foot down and you talk. Don't play, don't fall into that trap. You talk. You initiate the sex. You get it going. You move on and enjoy your life with your mate while you can because one of you will be dead soon and you're going to wish uh, you had them back here. And, and so uh, everybody in the family ought to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to love my family. Uh, with all of our faults and failures, I, I'm going to thank God for my family, and I'm going to enjoy my family while I can, because they may be gone soon. And if the plague does not get you to talking like that, I don't know what will. Regarding this passage, Matthew Henry wrote in his commentary, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to love God and our neighbor better than all burnt offerings. We are here warned not to rest in these performances. God demands the heart. God demands the heart. God demands the heart. And how can human inventions please him? When repentance, faith, and holiness are neglected, in the day of distress, we must apply to the Lord by fervent prayer our troubles. Though we see them coming, from God's hand must drive us to him, not drive us away from him. Amen, somebody. Let's pray for everybody based upon the word of God found in Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Holy Father, God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for, the, for all Christian people, help us to pray, to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways, and to humble ourselves before you, and help us to get back to you, our first love. And Holy Father God, we praise you, and we thank you for blessing us as your believers, as believing Christians, rather, down through the years with salvation, spiritual, family financial, material, protection, and provision blessings. We pray that you would continue to do that in our lives. And Holy Father God, we pray according to your will. And at the same time, prepare us, Lord, for rougher seas. Lord, prepare us for good days and bad days. Prepare us, Lord, for uh, uh, celebrations and tra tragedies. Prepare us for weddings and funerals, and prepare us, Lord, for life and death. And help us to always be grateful and thankful for whatever comes in our lives as your saints. And uh, for Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us of our sins, our failures, and our faults. And, Lord, help everybody under the sound of my voice to pray without ceasing today to get your leadership, your guidance, and your direction to get healing in their home and in their family. And the Lord, uh, let your will be done about who gets sick and who dies. Lord, uh, I have nothing to uh, do with that. Let your will be done in our hours. And Holy Father God, uh, we praise you and we thank you for all of the great years you gave us. We thank you also for the plague because it shows your love for us as well that you don't want us to stay the same. You love us so much that you don't want us to stay the same. And so my prayer is still the same since the beginning. Holy Father God, be thorough with us. Drive the trash and the sin and the evil and the devil and the demons of hell, the fornication and the adultery, the homosexuality, the lying, the dishonesty, supporting of homosexuality, uh, 
disobedience, rebelliousness out of the lives of people in your church and out of the church permanently. And out of denominations which were getting ready to split before the plague even happened. And out of the government, and out of the president's life, and out of all of the government, for Lord, the family, the church, and the government has messed up the greatest country in the history of the world only because you, and we were only great because you made us great. You blessed us to be great. On our money is in God we trust. And we have betrayed the God we trust. And now the plague is on us like never before. We're the leading country and we should be. As far as deaths and uh, cases. Have mercy and grace upon us. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive us of our sins. Help us to repent. Help us to turn from our evil ways. And help us to humble ourselves before you and to get back to you our first love and now holy father god we pray for everybody in the government from the president on down we pray lord for salvation spiritual family uh, life uh, protection and provision blessings upon all of your government ministers Lead them and guide them and direct them in the way that they should go. And, Lord, help our president to take sound advice about a situation that he knows nothing about. And instead of pivoting to his strength, which will end up undoing him, help him, Lord, to listen to the words of the prophet and uh, go that route and... uh, He'll be amazed at how you will uh, change things if he does what he's supposed to do. And Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for all other governments of the world. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, We pray, Lord, for all of the other governments in the world in the same way. We pray, Lord, for the protection and provision and deliverance of all Christians who are being persecuted. We thank you, Lord, for the National Day of Prayer on yesterday and uh, the good that was done in prayer and through prayer. And, uh, Holy Father God, we pray for the salvation of all lost people, including uh, people in the media, all lost people in this country, around the globe, and in the media. We pray for the revival of all of the saints in this country, around the globe, and in the media as well. In Jesus Christ's name, we continue to pray. We pray now for the family and friends and church family of Jamaican pastor Christopher Howard. These are all people who have died in the coronavirus plague. I know that many of you don't like the word plague, but that's what it is according to the Bible. For the family, we pray for the family and friends of New York firefighter Andrew uh, DiMaggio. For, we pray for the family and friends of the New Jersey 9-11 ferry pilot Luis Fernando Marulanda. We pray for the family and friends of uh, the New Jersey police officer Michael Connors Sr., We pray for Maud's family, the young black man who was killed, uh, some believe even lynched. Comfort that family as only you can. Thank you for working a miracle and uh, bringing those men to justice. We pray for the family and friends of New York police officer Edward Sioka. We pray for the family and friends and church family of Louisiana church member Willie Howard. We pray for the family and friends and church family of Louisiana church member Cornell Johnson. We pray that you would comfort all of these people and help them to turn their eyes towards you, Lord Jesus. Help them to turn to your holy word for comfort, 
but nobody can comfort them like you in this unbearable, humanly speaking, situation. We pray for the family and friends and church family of Louisiana church member Joseph Johnson. We pray for the family, friends, and church family of Louisiana church member Evelyn Jones. We pray for the family and friends and church family of Louisiana church member Eric Joseph. We pray for the family and friends and church family of Louisiana church member Jeanette Marshall. We pray for the family, friends, and church family of Louisiana church member Harold Nelson. We pray for the family and friends and church family of Louisiana church member Rufus Tenson. We pray for the family and uh, uh, church family of Louisiana church member Ida Williams. Lord, comfort all of these people in only the way that uh, you can and help them to turn their eyes towards Jesus for salvation and for comfort and towards your holy word. We pray for the family, friends, and church family of Michigan Church Elder Philip Parrish. And we commit these souls into your hands as well as ours. Let your will be done in their lives and in ours. And, Lord, we thank you for the lives of these people. And now we pray for some special prayer requests that have come in directly to us. We receive prayer requests uh Nearly every day, and I really mean that, every, uh, nearly every day. Uh, uh, I'm shocked when we don't get a prayer request in. And again, I do thank the Lord for my daughters, Daniqua and Danielle, who help deal with that. And that's one of the most, one of the most, one of the hardest jobs and thankless jobs that a person can do, and the devil really attacks you for um, collecting those prayer requests and making sure they're on the list the same day so we can start praying for them, not not weeks ahead and weeks later and all that foolishness. They put the prayers up the same day so that we can start praying for them. And I thank God for that. We pray for William, for his mom, Carol, uh, to be healed and help her to feel better for everyone else who has the flu or coronavirus to get better as well. We pray for Naeem, remove the coronavirus from the world and provide all people living on daily wages with the necessities that they need. Provide Naeem's ministry with supplies to help others. We pray for Ravi. Please remove the coronavirus from the world is his prayer request. And provide him with soaps, tissues, sanitizer, masks, and food to give to the poor children. Bless him with Urdu Bibles and children's Bibles, sewing machines, and tables for the widows food for the orphans and the disabled, uh, children and food packages for the poor and needy families in Pakistan. Bless their prayer meetings and gospel outreaches as well. And uh, these people that we're praying for, if you can, if God has blessed you with some means and you want to meet those needs, uh, you can send it to through us and we'll make sure they get it. Uh, even if you don't uh, want to send the money, send the things that they're asking for and praying for and uh, uh, help us with a little postage to get it to them, that would help a great deal. So you know, when we're praying for somebody and you can meet a need and God has blessed you with funds uh, to help with that, please do that. We pray for Stephen. Please bring his wife back from Europe guide them in their marriage, and protect them from the coronavirus disease. We pray for Nita. Please protect her and her loved ones from the coronavirus disease. We pray for Naeem. Be with all Pakistani Christians during this hard time and help all Pakistani Christians to keep the faith. Bless Naeem's ministry efforts and protect Pakistan from the coronavirus disease. We pray for Vicki. 
please be with all families with disabled members in the family during the coronavirus plague. And Lord, we pray for all of the people listed as others are taking on uh, the rest of the list for today. And Holy Father God, we pray now for all people who have gotten saved through this ministry and who have rededicated their life through the ministry. And uh, we pray for Christy, and we pray for these people, help them to grow in the faith and to stand strong in the faith, even during these times, and especially during these times. We pray for Christy, uh, Galagaki, Jody, Rusha, uh, Elvis, Tammy, Gajon, and many, many others. We're just naming a few today. And, Lord, we pray for those who have recommitted their life to you. We pray for Bobby, Damie, Patience, uh, Rodwell, Oyewo, uh, Bea, and Susan. And we commit these souls into your hands as well as ours. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray and for his sake. Amen. The Holy Suffering of the Saint by Oswald Chambers. First Peter chapter four, verse nineteen. Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good. Allow me to share that with you again. I want you to get that before we leave and and come into a close. Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good. Choosing to suffer means that there must be something wrong with you. But choosing God's will, even if it means you will suffer, is something very different. No normal, healthy saint, no matter how spiritual, ever chooses suffering. Suffering is not fun. People who are suffering with the coronavirus today, even the doctors and nurses are saying it is a monster. That's how they describe it. It is a beast. One beautiful doctor, young lady, 48 years old, killed herself. Because she couldn't stand the fact that this monster would kill the people in the ambulances before we can get them out. She was head of emergency room care. Before the people can get them out of the ambulances, the people would die. As they were getting out, they would die. She couldn't take it. He simply chooses God's will, just as Jesus did, whether it means suffering or not, and no saint should ever dare to interfere with the lesson of suffering being taught in another saint's life. Look at God's incredible waste of his saints according to the world's judgment. God seems to plant his saints in the most useless places. And then we say, God intends for me to be here because I am so useful to him. Yet, Jesus never measured his life by how or where he was of the greatest use. God places his saints where they will bring the most glory to him. And we are totally incapable of judging where that may be. So, Do God's will, dear friend, and not yours. Walk by faith and not by sight. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you so much for our time together here on this beautiful Friday morning, even while we're in this plague. And Holy Father God, I pray that you'll make it real to everybody under the sound of my voice and help us who believe in you to confess our sins 
to turn from our wicked ways, to repent, to humble ourselves before you, to pray, and to get back to you, Lord Jesus, our first love. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you'll grant us your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit <clears throat> through the computer, through the Internet, through social media. Lord, make every household a hub of, uh, uh, of evangelism and prayer for a dying and lost world. We can't wait now. There's no need to wait to witness now. We, uh, we, we, we know for a fact that people all around us, in our states, our counties, and in our cities and across the nation, uh, by this evening, 3,000 or more will be dead in this country alone multiplied thousands will be dead around the world. So, Lord, help us to pray for everybody, every soul, and help us to send out gospel tracts online. Help us, Lord, to do a podcast, video and audio about the gospel, about our testimony on how we got saved. Lord, help us to do whatever we can to witness to a dying and lost world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, dear friend, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, John 3.16, uttered by none other than Jesus Christ, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Dear friend, the Bible also says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? saved to heaven. So, dear friend, if you believe in your heart today what Jesus said, if you would believe that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, and rose from the dead by the power of God early one Sunday morning, and you're willing to uh, pray to him, believing in your heart that he suffered, bled, and died, on the cross for your sins as the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, including yours, was buried and rose on the third day. Then I'm willing to lead you in prayer with what is called the sinner's prayer. Mean it from your heart. Repeat after me phrase by phrase. Holy Father God, <clears throat> Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. For I have broken your Ten Commandments. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. Forgive me of my lying, my dishonesty. Forgive me of my stealing, my lusting, and coveting after people and things in my heart. Forgive me of my sin of dishonoring and disobeying my parents. Please forgive me of taking your holy name in vain. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart in your Holy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose on the third day by your power early one Sunday morning. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. I receive your free gift 
of salvation. I cannot work my way to heaven. I cannot pay any money to get into heaven. I cannot join a church to get into heaven. And so I believe in you, Lord Jesus. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past. And help me to turn from my evil life and to follow you in the new life, Lord Jesus. For it is in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, dear friend of mine, if you just trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God, you are now saved from hell and you are on your way to heaven based upon what the Holy Bible says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou you shall be saved. <clears throat> Dear friend, welcome to the family of God. I want to congratulate you on doing the most important thing in life, and that is believing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com. And read my pamphlet titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastor.